Our message today is uh, Never Say Never, and our text is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that a few of you were wise in the world's eyes, or powerful or wealthy, when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those that think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted not as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of the Lord. Father, I pray today for the word. I pray that you would encourage us, increase our faith, Help us to walk by your Spirit, Lord. Let us not walk in our own understanding, but let us be led by the Spirit. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things I've found over the years of reading the Gospels and that I really find interesting is that Jesus was an awesome storyteller. Did you notice that? He always told a story, and then he brought the word in to substantiate what the story was. And so I want to open with a a story. I don't know whether it's true or not. It could be. Uh, But there was a ship in the mid-1800s that got caught in a huge storm. And it was blown off course and into uncharted waters. And as they were lost in this vast sea of the South Pacific, all of a sudden from the crow's nest there was a call, Land ho! And the captain looked and off in the distance were some small islands. And so they set sail for the islands, and they came to the first island, and they found a small bay, and they lay anchor in there, and the captain and a few of the crew went on shore through a dinghy. And as they came on shore, they found children that were hungry and dirty and needy, and there, there wasn't anything going on. There wasn't any agriculture. There were tribal wars, and he thought, oh, what can I do? How can, how can I be of help here? With that, he left, and they sailed to the second island, and they lay anchor again, and when they came ashore, the captain and his crew found very much the same thing. There weren't any schools, there weren't any medical facilities, there, there wasn't ag- any agriculture, and again, he, he found himself saying, what can I do? So they weighed anchor, and they sailed to the third island, and the third island was much bigger than the first two. And when they came ashore, they found something that was vastly different than what they experienced on the first two islands. The children were well fed and clothed. There were irrigated fields growing crops. There were roads going from one village to the next village. And soon the chief came up to him and he looked at the chief and he said, Chief, why why is it so different here? The, The other two islands, they have nothing and yet you seem to be flourishing. What's, what's the difference here? And the chief looked at him and said, Father Benjamin, Father Benjamin taught us about agriculture and he taught us about medicine and he taught us about God. And the captain was just totally captivated by this. He said, take me to where Father Benjamin lives. And so the chief called a couple other elders and they conferred amongst themselves and pretty soon they led him to the shore. And at the shore they found some tidal basins that were connected by channels and sluice gates and different things. And when the high tide would come in, the tidal basins would fill with fish and they'd have plenty of protein. And there were fishermen to harvest the fish. And the captain was totally amazed by this and he said, This is incredible. He said, show me where Father Benjamin lives. The chief looked at him and he couldn't figure it out. He conferred with the other two elders and they said, well, let's go to the other side of the island. So they went to the other side of the island and there they found a clinic. It was a thatched roof clinic, but it had clean beds in it. And it had shelves that had medicines and bandages on it. And it had a staff that was trained in medical procedures. 
And the captain was, again, just dumbfounded by it, the difference. And he said, this is incredible. Show me where Brother Benjamin lives, Father Benjamin. And the chief, again, was confused. And he talked to the other two elders, and they said, okay, come with us. And they took the captain up the steep trail up the side of the mountain, and they came pretty soon to a thatched roof that was a chapel. And the chief took him inside. And inside was an altar with a big wooden cross. There were benches for people to sit on. And all the altar laid a big Bible. And the chief very reverently said, Father Benjamin taught us about God. And again, the chief said, or the captain said, this is incredible. He said, show me where Father Benjamin lives. I want to talk to him. And the chief just kind of stood back and he said, Father Benjamin died years ago. And the captain said, I asked you to show me where he lives. You didn't tell me that he died. And the chief said, you didn't ask about his death. You asked me to show you where he lives. I just, I, I'm just so moved by this story. Because you see, Father Benjamin could have said no to the prompting of the Lord. He could have said, no, I don't, I, I don't want to go there. And yet his life outlived his natural life. The impact of his life far outlived his natural life. God took a humble priest to an unknown island in the middle of the South Pacific a place in uncharted waters, a place that nobody else ever knew it existed. Yet the legacy of this servant of God lived many years past his passing. Reminds me of a quote that I read recently by a teenage blogger by the name of Katie Connor. There are many things I have learned from God and things I have learned about him. And there's one thing lately I've been thinking about, and that is never say never to him because he turns a lot of your nevers into forevers. Never say never to God. For he takes your nevers and turns them into forevers. Teenage girl. How profound. And yet it's something that we should all consider. Are there nevers in your life? Are there things you've said never to, to God? There's a man in the Bible who said never to God. I think you all know him. His name is Jonah. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach judgment on the city. And he said, no, 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 not going. Mm -mm. They don't deserve it. The city of Nineveh was so big, it took three days to walk across it. The Bible tells us there were 120,000 people living there. Now, in Bible times, generally speaking, the census would only count men. And so we could estimate that the population of Nineveh was anywhere from 120,000 to 600,000 people. And God told Noah or Jonah, to go and preach. And you all know the story. He jumps ship. Gets out of boat, and he's sailing for Tarshish, and, the, and another storm blows up, just like the story in the first, or first story. Sailors are throwing stuff overboard, trying to lighten the ship, trying to cut, trim the sails, throwing out a sea anchor to slow things down, and nothing is working, so they cast lots to see what's going on, and the lot falls on Jonah. 
And Jonah says, yeah, it's my fault, guys. Take me and throw me over the sea, over the, into the sea. So the sailors do that. They throw Jonah into the sea, and as you know, a large fish swallows him. But here's the first forever. Jonah 1, verses 15 and 16. Then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. The whole crew of the ship turned to God because of Jonah. And here's the first forever in the story. After three days, we find Jonah walking the streets of Nineveh, declaring the judgment of God, and people are falling to their knees and repenting. You know, it kind of reminds me of the stories of Smith Wigglesworth walking by taverns and people falling to their knees and, and asking Jesus into their lives. Similar thing is happening here in Nineveh, and it gets so be- uh, pronounced that even the king declares a fast and tells everybody to put on sackcloth and ashes and repent. The whole city, the whole city repents and comes to a knowledge of the Lord. This has to be the greatest revival in the history of the Bible. 600,000 people at one time come to repentance unto the Lord. Here's a question. Could God, could God do it again? Could God take your never and turn it into a forever for someone else? I like this quote from Michael Jordan. Never say never because limits like fears are often just an illusion. Isn't that true? Have you ever told God never and found yourselves years later doing exactly what you said never to? Anybody else guilty? You see, we often let our fears and our own plans for our lives dictate our reactions to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Truth is, is we can't let our fears, our inadequacies, our own ideas of limitations limit us and prevent us from serving God and responding to those promptings of the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't let what's wrong with you define you. Psalm 94, 19. When doubts fill my mind, your comfort gives me renewed hope and cheer. Never say never. When we were in Minnesota and planning our first church, we had a young teenager and and he was having a difficult time in his life and the youth pastor said, well, come on, we'll go to the altar and Pastor Dan will pray for you. And uh, this went on for several weeks and Chris kept saying, no, 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 no. And finally the youth pastor said, well, how come you don't want to go up and have Pastor Dan pray for you? Because he's going to say, I'm called to be a missionary in Africa and eat goat's eyes. (laughs) About 20 years later or so, that young man, when now a father of three, married, took to a trip to Africa for two weeks to help build a chapel in the middle of the bush. And it changed his life. It said never. And God took that never and turned it into a forever. How many people in Africa now worship the Lord because he went and served? you ever noticed that in our society we have a tendency to put labels on people? You know, it, it, it's not only unhealthy, it's, it's unholy, it's dehumanizing, but it happens a lot. And I want to encourage you today, don't let anyone define who you are in Jesus, not even yourself, don't. 
Don't let your own inadequacy stop you. See, you were made to make a difference. I want to repeat that. You were made to make a difference. Here's how the scripture defines you. You are more than a conqueror in Romans 8.37. You are the apple of God's eye in Zechariah 2.8. You are sought after in Isaiah 62.12. You are joint heir with Christ in Romans 8.17. You are a child of God, Matthew 16.18. You were made to make a difference. You can't expect life to make sense when you walk with the Holy Spirit. What what do you do? What do you do with the God moments in your life? What What do you do when God comes in and interrupts your plans? What do you do when God interrupts your dreams? What do you do with the plans that you've laid out for your life? How do you respond? See, when you walk with Jesus, there's a certain amount of uncertainty. I've said it before, but another word for faith is risk. You have to risk. You know why? Because Jesus is predictably unpredictable. Jesus is predictably unpredictable. You never know when he's going to show up. You're never going to know when he shows, shows off like he did at the wedding of Cana. But I think you can be sure of this. He will probably ask you to do something that's unprecedented, unorthodox, and unconventional. If you have the courage to do something he asks you, you might experience something you haven't seen in a long time. Like sell sell everything you own, take three kids and go on a mission field. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things He planned for us long ago that we can do the good things he planned for us to do. Would would God do with us what he did with his first followers? Would he use you and I just as he did the first disciples? John 14, beginning at verse 12, gives us the answer. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You know, the cry from our heart today ought to be, do it again, Jesus, do it again. You see, there's a call on each and every one of your lives. You were made to make a difference. Have you ever found that God is a God of suddenlies? I have. We make our plans, we live our lives, and suddenly God breaks in. And I begin to wonder, did he hear me say the word never? Suddenly, Acts chapter 2, verse 2. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where we were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability The Holy Spirit came on them suddenly, not predictably, not expectedly. This, this event had never occurred before. It's unprecedented. It's never happened. And all of a sudden, there's a sound of a mighty Russian wind. 
and tongues of fire appear upon their heads. And that strange phenomenon of speaking in tongues happens to the disciples. Welcome to the world of Acts and the suddenlies of the Holy Spirit. See, God's not constrained by time, methodologies, or techniques. He's not constrained by what our plans are or what we're doing. He wants to break in because he wants to make a difference. And he can only do that if he has agents of change. People that are willing to risk. It's spontaneous. And it defies what's considered to be the norm. People who are willing to step out in faith. Someone who never says never to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I can remember we were at a pastor's conference, Judy and I were. We were in our first church in, in Minnesota, and we'd been there it was over five years, and the church was growing, and things were happening, and we planted a church out of it, and we were content, and God was doing good things, and we had a core group of people that loved us and supported us, prayed with us, and believed for God to do great things. And we were in this conference, and the speaker got up and he said, you know, in New England, there are cities of 60,000 people that have no evangelical witness of Jesus Christ. Judy and I both looked at each other, I mean, at the same moment and went, did you just get what I got? Yeah. We were to go. A suddenly. It wasn't our plan. It wasn't anything we had hoped to do. It wasn't anything we aspired to do. Suddenly, God spoke. Suddenly, we had a decision to make. Do we say where things are good and going well? Or do we respond to the prompting of the Lord? Y'all have heard this quote many times in churches and says, God did not call the qualified, he qualifies the, co- the called. You heard that? Yeah, it's true. What does our text say? It says, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose the things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of the Lord. God can take your nevers and turn them into forevers. She is an unassuming person, very small of stature, kind of bent, She wore a white sari, had a blue stripe on it. This woman that grew up in the Balkans in a family of three children was shy as a child. She was retiring. She was sickly. And yet, she believed that God loved those in distress. She believed that God love the poor. And that if she would love the poor, Jesus would love them through her. Most of you know the story of Mother Teresa. In 1989, she gave an interview, and she was telling the interviewee that uh, she believed that roughly 54,000 people were helped in their ministry, and 23,000 had died in their care. She said, give me your unborn children and I will love them. Give me your orphans and I will take care of them. And she founded the Ministry of the Missionaries of Charity in India. 
Calcutta, Indian, 54,000 people were touched by this little woman from Eastern Europe. What if she said never? I wonder if God creates people like Mother Teresa so he can prove his point. Maybe, just maybe, you could do something today that would outlive your life. There are several billion reasons to consider that. Some of them live in your neighborhood. Some of them are in jungles that you'll never see. And some of them have names that you can't even pronounce. Some of them play in cardboard slums. Some are forced to sell themselves on street corners. Some of their woes have not be brought on by themselves and maybe they inherited it from their families or perhaps they were enslaved. There are people all around us that need Jesus. People are not going to come because we put a sign out on Harrison Avenue. People are not going to come because Dan, Pastor Dan's preaching or Pastor Jared's preaching or Pastor Patrick. They're going to come because of you. What, 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 what if I never said never to go to Hong Kong? What if, I, what if I chose to say, I, I just want to make my life here? I have a friend who many years ago supported us as we went on the mission field, and he, he told me of the story of a young man that was a friend of his. He was attending the Dallas Theological Seminary. And this young man really wanted to be in business. He didn't, he didn't want to go into the ministry. And... So one day he left the house, his wife, and I don't remember if he had children or what, but he borrowed a rowboat and he went on this lake in that area and he rowed out on the lake and he had a fishing line in the water, didn't really care if he fished it, but he was out there and he said, God, if you really want me to go into the ministry and be a pastor, make a fish jump in the boat. A fish jumped in the boat. <laughs> and he sat there for a moment. He said, God, if that's really you, make another fish jump in the boat. <laughs> another fish jumped in the boat. True story. He rowed to shore and walked away from the ministry, walked away from God, and was never heard of again. See, we have a choice. God doesn't force anything on us. God doesn't make you do something. But he would call your name. He would say, I have an assignment for you. None of us can help everyone but all of us can help someone. And when we help them, we serve Jesus. Remember the quote from Katie? There are many things I have learned from God and things I have learned about him. And there's one thing lately I have been thinking about, and that is never say never to him because he turns a lot of your nevers into forevers. Never say never. Because he takes your nevers and turns them into four hours. God wants to take you out of your comfort zone. The cry of our hearts should be, Lord, make me more hungry for you, Jesus. Shake me. 
Something has to change. Make me an agent of, agent of change. Do it again, Jesus. Do it again. I know from personal experience it's a dangerous prayer to pray. But I know this truth. Because of a willingness to serve him, there are some forevers that will outlive my life. Never say never, for in so doing, you will definitely outlive your life, and Jesus will be glorified. Jesus will be glorified. I want you to take a moment. Would you bow your heads? Especially young people in this church. God is speaking to you today. Never say never. For he's got a call on your lives. He has something to do with your lives. Your, our lives are not your own. You've been bought with a price. The blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you that are chronologically more mature may have some nevers that you've said to God. I'm going to ask you today to lay those nevers down. Maybe you have plans and purposes for your life, but God would like to interrupt those. I don't, I don't know what they could be. I'm not here to prophesy over you and tell you what you're called to. Only you can hear the voice of God for yourself and respond. But I would ask you today to maybe die to self just a little bit more. Maybe to lay down your preconceived ideas. Maybe to lay down your comfortableness. Maybe God wants to speak something to you today. I'm going to ask you just to take a moment. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not going to pray over you right now. But I want you just to open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Ask him if there's something he wants to do in your life. Ask him if there's something he wants you to do. Ray asked Pastor Marty to come. Oh, there he is. Never mind. Father, I pray right now that your spirit would move upon us. God, embolden us. Holy Spirit, come upon us with anointing and power for this day and for the, for the day after and the day after that. That, Lord, we not walk in our own understanding, but we be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That is that still, small voice that speaks behind us. This is the way we walk in it. Lord, lead us to someone that needs you. Help us to help them. Lord, I surrender. I surrender my hopes, my dreams. I surrender my comfortableness to you. And I ask, Lord, that you would radically interrupt my world. Do it again, Jesus. Do it again. Do what you did in the first disciples. Stir our hearts. 
Let passion grow within us. That God, we, we go beyond ourselves and somehow, in some way, what little things we do becomes a forever for somebody else. God, I pray that you would use us to make a difference in our world. I thank you for that, Lord. I praise you today. For you alone are worthy to be praised. You alone are worthy to be worshipped and adored, Jesus. And in your name we pray. Stand with me and receive the blessing of the Lord. I believe it's important to send you out with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for joining us on our live stream today. Our hope is that you will discover life in Christ. If you have a prayer need, please take time to fill out a connection card from our website, or you may also send an email to prayer at rockchurch.net, and one of our pastors will follow up with you as soon as possible. For more information about our church, please visit our website at rockchurch.net. We hope to see you in person for one of our live services on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. God bless you today.